And four members of uh, that Sean will be joining us by teleconferencing, and hopefully the star system is working fine, Sean. I advise members that they're welcome to use Wi-Fi connected mobile devices, uh, providing their airplane mode. And if members are content, we'll proceed through the agenda as follows. Uh, we have no apologies. Uh, reminding members to declare any relevant financial or other interests at each committee meeting as applicable. Your bill. My bill, and I apologise in the sense that I have to leave. You got PAC it for the audit committee. Audit committee. At one o'clock. What time is that, at, Jim? That's one o'clock. Okay. Shortly thereafter. Okay. Uh, I'd like to uh, uh, draft minutes of the proceedings on the 9th of September 2020 and inform members an amended set of draft minutes of the meeting on the 9th of September are tabled at uh, page 2. Have we had a chance to review those? Are members content that the draft minutes are an accurate record of proceedings? Okay. Those who were here? Mm -hmm. and are you happy for the minutes to be published on the website? <coughs> yep. Okay. Good. Thank you very much indeed. If we move on to the matters arising, firstly, for the renewable heat incentive disciplinary process, remind members at last week's meeting the committee agreed to consider a letter to the Speaker in relation to the provision of information to assemblies committees. Uh, as I discussed uh, earlier on, sort of in closed session, I had already met with the um, Minister of Finance. Uh, the issue particularly is to do with one court case that is due. I won't give details in open session. But the aim is to have this information before the committee next week if we are content. Agreed. Okay. And there was, again, you had a, a course of action in relation to a letter to the Speaker. I think we can leave that to next week if we are content. Agreed. Can we move on now to uh, the Memorandum of Understanding in the Budget Process? And can I invite Mr. Jeff McGuinness to come in to us, talk to us? Jeff, welcome back to the committee. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Jeff McGuinness is head of the Central Expenditure Division of the Department of Finance. Uh, I'd like to inform the members of the following papers related to this agenda item. Uh, the Clerk's Brief Memorandum of Understanding on the Budget Process at page 22. Uh, departmental Briefing, uh, MOU and Budget Process, uh, page 23 and the draft MOU on the budget process on page 26. Uh, please, opening statement. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Um, thank you for the opportunity, Chair, to brief you today on a potential memorandum of understanding between the Executive <coughs> and the Committee on the Budget Process. Um, as you know, the Executive has a responsibility for drawing up a programme for government and associated budget, and committees have a statutory duty to hold the Executive to account and to scrutinise the work of departments. When that relationship, that dynamic, is working well, it provides a transparency to the budget process where the committee are able to scrutinise the budget, but also, and crucially, they are able to feed into the process itself, challenging individual departmental requirements, assisting departments in shaping their priorities, channelling funding to essential services, and at the more strategic finance committee level, providing a commentary on, to the executive on the appropriate use of taxpayers' money. It's probably fair to say, Chair, that in the past that relationship may not have operated as effectively as possible. Um, back in 2011, a three-stage inquiry, um, the inquiry into the role of the Northern Ireland Assembly in scrutinising the Executive's budget and expenditure, was published by the then Committee for Finance and Personnel. MLAs and committees at the time had raised a series of concerns about the opportunity for the Assembly to contribute and exercise uh, influence in the budget process. There was a strong degree of support at the time for a memorandum of understanding. A, memor a memorandum of understanding would have a number of benefits in the budget process. Um, it would establish an agreed framework for improved cooperation. It would facilitate the Assembly, both MLAs and committees, in fulfilling their scrutiny and advice functions. It would assist the effective oversight of the Executive's strategic priorities. It would also assist the Executive as they manage the budget process. An initial draft of a Memorandum of Understanding was developed previously via work between uh, committee and DOF officials, building on some key principles, namely the recognition of the Executive's lead in budget setting, recognition of the value of assembly engagement in that budget process, regularity and flexibility in the budget process timetable, 
appropriate consultation with the Assembly and its committees, proportionality of Assembly demands on departments, maintaining constructive and effective working relationships, good communication, and respecting the role and maintaining the independence of oversight bodies. There are a number of areas where further work uh, will be required to ensure that an MOU is relevant and fit for purpose. Those areas include um, flexibility, adapting an MOU to a normal budget process. I'm sure, I'm sure I've said it before. I've worked in this area a long time, and a normal budget process hasn't happened in about 10 years. So, um, one of the issues that we previously encountered with the, the MOU and struggled to work through appropriately is the issue of how an MOU and the budget process can be formulated in such a way that allows it to work when the budget process itself um, changes from year to year. Uh, it would be unfair to hold either the executive or the uh, assembly to account on factors that are outside of their control. Um, if you think of our, the current process where we anticipated that we would have had a spending review envelope in July, and now that's not going to happen until uh, Treasury call it autumn, so we're not quite sure when that will happen. It throws our, our processes out the window, and any sort of an MOU going forward would have to consider how best to adapt to um, changing situations that are outside our control. One of the other areas that we would have to work through is the interaction with other protocols. The previous draft included references to other protocols that I believe were also in draft at the time and perhaps still are. Um, there was an information sharing protocol that um, the, the draft MOU referred to, and we would have to consider uh, where that was and whether that needed updated. Sorry, just a, do we know anything about an information sharing protocol? That's the um, information sharing between the Assembly and yes. a departments? There was a, yes, yeah. there was a draft protocol, I think, um, being worked through at the time of the, the draft MOU, and they were, look, they were looking at them. In this was back in 2012? Uh, yes, back then. Um, so we would have to work through that and whether they are still, um, whether those are, are still there, where they currently sit basically is, is where we'd have to, to understand. We also have to look at the interaction and in developments in the wider financial sphere. Was that information sharing protocol ever agreed? I don't believe so. I believe it was, was in draft at the time and I don't believe it, it ever moved from there. Who owns that? Um, I'm not sure. We were working with the committee clerk on it at the time, um, so I'm not quite sure whether it was ours uh, or whether it was CEOs brought in. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure who was working on it, but I would imagine it would probably be a, a agreed between the assembly and the executive it would be, rather yes, than the department. It would have, it would have to be a, a similar sort of agreement um, yeah. to an MOU would be agreed between the executive and the assembly. Yeah. Um, so, so there's that to consider. There's also the wider financial. So just, just I'm, I'm sort of because this is before my time. Mm -hmm. So, we're having to establish an MOU to establish the framework of release of information between the assembly and our executive, even though we have the Northern Ireland Act and all the other things that say that this is how the legislative process is supposed to be set up. I think that yes, I think the the certainly the information. I'm not, I'm not trying to be difficult. I just yeah. find it quite strange that we have to have an MOU to do something that should be happening. Anyway, as a, anyhow. And, and one of the one of the concerns that I would have, um, I'll touch on a wee bit later, is that, um, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Chair, that we we understand from a public finance perspective that we think we have quite a good working relationship with the committee, and we think that our information sharing works quite well at the moment. So one of the concerns that we would have would be that um, uh, an MOU might disrupt that genuine um, exchange of things. But um, certainly it's something that we have to, to bear in mind as we, we consider this. But we're, well, unfortunately, we're you, you will have heard from sort of various other chairs, but one of the things I've raised in the Assembly, of course, is the flow of information, particularly in the Justice Department, and the complete lack of information that they have. So, yeah. Uh, again, it comes back to the point is, uh, you know, having to put an MOU in place for something that should be happening as first principle, I think, is one of the concerns. But anyway, keep going. I, I just want to say we're conscious that maybe that, that is not the case for all committees in terms of sharing of information. Um, so we'll also have to look at the OECD recommendations on 
budgeting um, to make sure that an MOU uh, takes account of the wider financial sphere. Uh, and I will also add to this, uh, working through interaction with, with other areas, the interaction with the review of financial process. Um, we're currently proceeding with the necessary work that underpins that review. And I think that's probably one of the things that I'll be up in a week or two's time before you on. Um, so it'll be important to understand how the review impacts the work of the committee on the budget and estimate processes, as well as ensuring that the outworkings of the review are appropriately reflected in any potential memorandum. Um, one of the areas as well for, for further work is the potential for further administrative work with departments. I'm mindful that there's a tension that exists between the right of the Assembly to gather information to allow it to do its job appropriately and the burden that's placed on finance teams by the wider public expenditure process. And I'm, I'm not innocent in that. Um, I think if you ask finance directors, I probably am responsible for uh, quite a significant amount of their burden in terms of asking for different requests and financial exercises. So I'm um, just conscious that that's something that um, we will have to, to think through. Wasn't that one of the recommendations of about the RHI inquiry? Because one of the issues was to do with uh, specifically sort of access to financial information and the fact that particularly when what was then DETI, uh, there was very little oversight of what was going on and sort of the committee were being asked to uh, examine uh, information that they didn't actually have. Yeah, yeah um, um, one of the things I was about to say was, yeah, absolutely, we'll have to look at what RHI recommendations and how they will actually um, transfer potentially into any memorandum of understanding and whether there's an overlap there that we can take advantage of when we are actually looking at this. Um, uh, one of the other areas that we'll have to work through is, is arbitration. I think there's some work, further work that needs to be done to set out what may happen if things go wrong. Um, as, I, as I mentioned before, from a personal perspective, um, I'd be concerned that uh, a budget process might be uh, held up or impacted in some way because a single department hadn't fulfilled an element of its obligations to a committee. Whilst I won't underscore absolutely that it's important for departments to adhere to committee requests, um, there's a, the introduction of an MOU that gets its emphasis slightly wrong may mean that the budget process is delayed, um, which means that you could have a situation where you have a marked improvement from one year to the next in terms of the overall information flow um, to committees, but the, the budget process in the, in the year where the information flow improves is actually curtailed slightly or, or disrupted because an MOU is in place that says if this happens then there is a there is a, a, some sort of effect. So uh, uh, I, I, we want we need to be able to work through that so that um, we're heading in the right direction and that the, the perfection isn't nearly the enemy of progress in this area. So <laughs> that we have to work through. Um, and I appreciate that I probably come across as a typical risk of our civil servant when I say such things. So um, it, it, those sort of things may never happen. I but ever say it. <laughs> um, one of the other things as well is I'm very conscious that DOF are taking the lead in what will ultimately be an, uh, uh, so something that's signed off by the entire executive. And don't get me wrong, it's right that we do take the lead in this. It's very important that we do. Um, but I want to emphasise that it's not within our gift to agree this unilaterally. In that respect, the MOU must work for all departments and engagement with all departments and committees will probably need to take place on an MOU that is developed. I'd be the first to admit that I sit in an ivory tower in terms of central finance um, and I'm not at the cool face where FDs are actually working day in day out delivering on um, f financial implications for individual departments. But surely if all the permanent secretaries are accounting officers for their department and for the duties and responsibilities of accounting officer they report directly to the firm secretary of the Department of Finance, there should be no sort of uh, going on their own, no separate uh, sort of approaches from any departments because the guidance should be laid down very clearly through the guidance through the firm secretary of the Department of Finance, the other firm sex, because as accounting officers they are directly responsible to the Perm sec at finance because she holds the responsibility to government as the vote holder, surely? Uh, absolutely. Um, and I suppose one of the things that we would have to think through in terms of the MOU is this um, would we prefer this to be a stick or a carrot? Um, so if, if we get buy in and sign up to it from all areas rather than having it as a this is something that you must do, then um, I think uh, if, if it 
departments would get the opportunity to also look at it and potentially improve the process as well. Um, as I say, we are sitting in an ivory tower and maybe there are practical implications that departments may uh, come up with that say, well, actually, this is a better way to do this or this process does not work in the way that we engage with our particular committee. But surely since 2012 we have had a great opportunity to sort those out. We have had. I um, will defer to, uh, <laughs> to you on that one. Um, w there, there have been opportunities for us to improve the process, and we do continually try and improve the budget process. But I think this is a good opportunity for us to, to set out what, um, so it can be very clear with departments and, and um, uh, what is expected and what is required. Um, so those are some of the challenges, and looking forward, officials will um, be engaging with Committee Clark. Uh, I think there's maybe even a meeting in my diary this week on it, and uh, we'll be looking at how that draft MOU might be updated to reflect the current public expenditure environment. It's good to get this on the committee's radar, um, and I'm very happy to take any questions that you might have. Okay, um, uh, there's a couple of questions coming around, but there's just one particular. Obviously, what we wanted to see through new decade, new approach, was the fiscal council. And the role and responsibilities of the Fiscal Council, which we're eight months on and we haven't seen anything yet, and how this interrelates, because obviously one of the things that before, as part of this sort of, and you talk quite a lot about the, the relationship with the programme for government, as if this is a process that follows a path. I mean, I can't think of anything that has actually run smoothly or has actually occurred. And I think you said you said yourself, you know, nothing has occurred in ten years. So to do this as separate to what's happening with the Fiscal Council, and again, from my indications from the Finance Minister we received in questions yesterday, please correct me if I'm wrong, but he said he's quite a long way down the stage now of looking to terms of reference and getting the Fiscal Council set up. So can you explain the interrelationship we're going to see between the Fiscal Council, the budgeting process and the MOU? Uh, certainly. So um, as I've probably said before, um, I'm not uh, very close to the setup of the fiscal council and the arrangements there, because ultimately they will be marking my homework. So um, I think it's right that I'm a step removed from how that that's put put in. It will depend ultimately on the terms of reference for the fiscal council as to um, what those terms of reference look like and how they see themselves engaging with the budget process. Um, so uh, in some in some respects. Uh, I'm not sure that they will have very much interaction with an MOU between ourselves, um, because uh, between the executive and the assembly, you will have a, a degree of of work that is done before a budget is formulated. And I think potentially at that stage is where the fiscal council come in and say, "Okay, this is what you have done, um, and this is our thoughts on that process." I'm not sure that the fiscal council will come in at the formative stage and and effectively make suggestions on how the budget is done. So I, I, I think there's maybe a slight distinction between the MOU on how we formulate a budget and the interaction between committees and the executive on that process, and then where the Fiscal Council comes in. Now, it could be that one, whenever the Fiscal Council is established that they, they say, no, we want to have some view at that point, and it's at that stage we will have to think, right, how do we then amend that MOU or, or um, facilitate how the Fiscal Council want to, to interact with the budget process at that earlier point? Yeah, because uh, if we think about it logically, the political party should be creating the programme for government, but the first thing that should be done within that is an affordability assessment, and the affordability assessment is also part and parcel of where the Fiscal Council sits as well. But if that is the case, and that looks at what we're looking for the vote to be able to deliver the programme for government, and because we never have the money to do it, so it will be something to do that. That is when the budgetary process comes in. Mm -hmm. So, in some respects, the MOU is going to be vital to that understanding, but it must be done so that it is closely connected to where the programme for government sits, but also whether it is in the affordability envelope as well. So, actually, one of the things that we probably need to see as early as possible is the terms of reference of the Fiscal Council. Tim? Yep. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Paul? Yes, thank you. Jeff, thank you very much for your attendance here today and, and your candour and openness on these issues. It strikes me, though, at the heart of everything in this place and any democratic institution is openness, transparency, and accountability on any subject. 
uh, with regards to government's not least budget. And I take completely your statement with regards to timing. And a timing of any process is not in your own destiny. Whenever you're a devolved assembly, uh, and if you like, uh, under the the remitting wing of Westminster with regards to the budget process that they adopt. So ultimately that will knock you back every time they make a decision to knock something back themselves. So a memorandum of understanding on a timely process strikes me as not being in any way able to be enforced uh, unless you adopt reasonableness and establish what is a reasonable process from start to finish of a budget process. Uh, so within that, what it seems to me that we only need a memorandum of, un, of understanding because there has been a failure to date in openness and transparency. Would you, would you agree to that assertion? I think that was the conclusion that um, the original inquiry came to. Um, uh, I would say that um, there was certainly a, a significant degree of um, inability for the budget process to be open and transparent. Um, and I think that MLAs were frustrated by the ability that they, the, the, the inability to um, input appropriately into that process. And I think that's where they're, they came from. So one of the things that we're doing on that is looking at, for instance, the review of uh, financial process uh, and looking at how do we make that process more transparent? How do we translate a, an estimates document that um, is confusing and hard to understand into something that relates more directly to a budget and help that open and transparent process? So, yeah, I think you're right. There are, there are frustrations out there in terms of um, being able to appropriately interact, and one of the things then that this would help do would be to help um, committees and individual MLAs to understand um, what their role in the process is and where they they might um, meaningfully engage. One of the things that I, I talk to a lot of people around the budget and how we, um, both individuals and umbrella groups and on all sorts of interested parties in, in the budget process, one of the things that I try and um, direct them to is to understand at what point in the process they can most meaningfully input in order to influence the, the process. And that's one of the things that an MOU will help with, will help to MLAs and committees to understand at what point they can most meaningfully engage um, so that they can shape and, um, and criticise and um, comment on um, both individual departmental responses to the budget and also the, the wider budget as a whole. So it strikes me the problem is multi-layered. The, the bigger overall question is when will a budget come, Minister, is the first piece. And that is the decision for the Minister. And of course we have the previous Minister, Finance Minister, not bringing a budget to the Assembly when he should have. Uh, second point is the d varying degrees and levels of information being ascertained by the individual committees mm -hmm. or the individual departments. And it strikes me that um, it's not so much a memorandum of understanding you need. You need a basic general template that allows committees to know exactly what they need to get from their departments and the departments need to know exactly what they have to give to the because uh, a scrutiny committee's problem is this we don't know what we don't know so there has to be a benchmark or, and a level uh, of understanding as to what actually information and to what degree that information has to sprinkle down to the individual committees. So would you agree that if we had a proper template that all departments bought into and all committees bought into, that that would go some way to reducing the need for a memorandum of understanding? I mean, I, I think there's great merit in something like that. Um, and I believe that um, the, the Assembly Research are looking at something like that for um, monitoring, or, or have mm -hmm. been looking at something like that for monitoring. I think, I think sorry, just it's put a question for that we sort of produced a, a, a template yeah. that we started to use, 
and for the committees that actually had good relationships with their departments and was filled in, I thought it was quite a useful tool. Yep. But the reality was, and I refer again to justice, that uh, it's only as good as the information that's put into it. And I think again it comes back to the point about sort of if all the perm secretaries are accounting officers and um, are directly responsible to the finance uh, department of finance, perm secretary as the head, as the chief accounting officer, there shouldn't be any difference at all. Okay. But what that template did prove, in that it worked, is that the finance committee received more information yeah. than the justice committee. We had, to, we, had to, we, had to, we had to give information out to other committees. So that committee, that template actually worked uh, in, in scrutiny. Uh, another thing about memorandum of understanding, and that's been my final question, Chair, is that what sanction is there if a department, finance department or other departments breach it? It seems to me, having looked at the work that was done in the previous memorandum, the work there was that basically all a committee can do was take it to plenary and have a debate and give the minister whoever it would be a good thrashing. Now, surely a committee has that power anyway, uh, and that right to bring a debate or a motion to the floor of the Assembly anyway. So, to me, the memorandum didn't apply any further teeth or pressure to the department. Uh, and, of course, we still fall back on Section 44 of the Northern Ireland Act 1998 with regards to the powers of this committee. Uh, call uh, any person uh, to produce documents uh, and information, uh, and that doesn't always work. That sanction of having Section 44. So um, I, I'm not sure that unless you had a willing partner in the department that was completely and openly transparent and open, that a memorandum of understanding would even work. Uh, th there's a, an element of um, truth in, in what you say. It, it relies on um, a degree of cooperation, and, and all of these things will rely on a degree of cooperation. I think having a memor memorandum of understanding that is right and appropriate, and that maybe departments have signed up to, might um, might allow departments to to understand um, more formally what that engagement looks like and where that engagement kind of happens and how, how what's expected of them. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, I, it may be that nothing changes if you put in a memorandum of understanding, but actually it may be that something does change. And that might be the, the um, that, that might be a very useful thing. Um, so you're right, if, if a memorandum of understanding is put in place and nobody adheres to it, then we're ex in exactly the same position. Um, but uh, maybe I'm more hopeful uh, that actually whenever we have something that is uh, written down and signed up to by the executive ultimately, because it will be ministers that will sign up to this, um, that that will be the, the incentive for departments to both understand the interaction with committees through the budget process, um, but also then to engage effectively and, and prepare for that engagement. Okay, thank you, Chief. Okay, Matthew. Thanks, Chair. Um, can I just ask, when was this Memorandum of Understanding first drafted? Three years ago. Um, po post 2011, so it's, it's, right. it's um, uh, I think, the last draft or the, the, the previous draft is something like 2014. So this version we're looking at is from about 2014? Yes, it's, a, it's around six years old. Yeah. Um, it, but it doesn't stand and that we've never agreed it in the committee. Is it, why haven't we, the, it may be asking quite basic information, it would just be helpful to know why it's never why are we discussing it now and it hasn't been discussed? I mean, with ex notwithstanding the fact that we weren't sitting for three years? Um, I, I think uh, work was done on it to a point in time. Um, I am not quite sure at what stage that work was then stopped. Um, possibly pressures of other things had happened and then it was never kind of readdressed again. So that's why we're trying to pick it up now. Right, okay. So this wasn't. I mean, I, and then I don't remember this coming up in the discussions of the committee until recently. Was it, did we discuss it before? I, I, I'm not trying to impugn the motives of the department. I'm just trying to get to the bottom. Of it. And, 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 because, and in part, the reason I ask is that I note that the, the memorandum of understanding refers to DFP, which is obviously B 2016. B 2016 and the department. So, it, it w is there is it important that this document is sort of proof to that first of all the acronyms are right, but also that it reflects precisely where we are post 
NDNA and also the RHI inquiry. I don't know if that's an exercise that's worth doing. Uh, well, that's part of what the process will be. Doing now. So okay. we are engaging with uh, Committee Clark and his colleagues um, to update this. This is not something that we would present to anyone at this point in time. Okay. We would have to. That, that's why there's a number of areas where I have concerns that we need to work through and, and appropriately draft it. Just on the, the um, point seven, or I guess clause seven says the recognition of the value of assembly engagement in the budget process. Um, given the assembly is no spending can happen unless the assembly approves it. That's the, the law under the Northern Ireland Act. Is that a is that is the value of assembly engagement an adequate um, uh, summation of our role? Um, I mean, perhaps not. Perhaps it's it's underplayed, um, and that's something that we can draft into it in terms of um, uh, beefing yeah. that up in some way or other. I suppose my concern would be that that language kind of implies that we are almost statutory consultees in a planning process. That we are. It's good practice to write to us and tell us what's happening, whereas in fact, we are inherent and um, fundamental to the process in that. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Just, just to say to that, um, you'll notice one of the things that we did work on in the previous draft was uh, a, a timetable. Now it hadn't done anything on it, but it had um, an understanding of where the committee would engage with the process. And back to my kind of earlier point about mm. how do we get the right people to engage at the right time in the, in the process. Um, up to this stage, uh, generally, what happens is we'll have a draft budget. Generally, <laughs> mm. typically, mm. Um, we have a draft budget. There is well, a period. We haven't had a typical one in ten years. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I caveat that absolutely. Uh, we will have a period of consultation where typically the, the committee would have drawn together um, re, uh, reports from individual committees and produced a, a joint report um, and a take note debate, and then we would have had a revised budget. But that that committee engagement would have. Um, been in between draft and revised. And one of the things that we were thinking through at the time of the, um, the MOU previously was actually that's probably not the best place for a committee to engage in the process. The best place for committees to engage in the process is before the draft budget so that there is a, a process that committees engage with each other and then the, the Finance Committee, looking at its strategic point of view, will produce a report that then helps to inform a draft budget as opposed to inform the changes between draft and revised. Mm -hmm. And that, that might that's radical. That's that's that we haven't done that before. But I think that's maybe a better way for the committees to effectively engage in the process. Apologies, Matthew, but wasn't the original going back, wasn't the original intent within the Northern Ireland Act for the formation of the committees that the committees would be fundamental in the structuring and building budget rather than okaying budget. So Indeed, the departments would have come and said, look, here's my spending priorities, this is what I'm looking to do, what do you think, rather than this is the budget that I've done, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm, I'm sure that, that does happen and departments do come in that beto before the draft budget to individual committees. Um, I'm not quite sure that we would then have had a, a joint response from the committee to the finance minister before a draft budget. It maybe would have happened between draft and revised. So this would this would bring that response back a few weeks or or, or whatever period of time, so that the, the finance uh, minister could understand what the committee's view is before the formulation of that the draft budget Budget's itself. Yeah, because it needs to be much earlier in the process. Yeah, yes, sorry, Matthew. Okay. Sorry, apologies. No, that's fine. And the, is your suggestion is the outworking of this? Then it sort of refers to standing orders in here that st standing orders will be amended to. Assembly standing orders would be amended once this is agreed to reflect. I think that is the um, certainly from the committee's point of view. I think that would be uh, one of the things that they would be uh, eager for that to be retained. The the, oh, the well, sorry. The, sorry, in the draft, um, they would be eager for the standing orders to be amended. Yeah, the, the standing order obviously the already refers to I mean, the chairperson of the committee of finance has. Role, uh, you know, their Steve's role in this case, that the the role the and the committee's role is set out to some degree, but it would be reading into this MOU would imply that it, there will be even more elaboration of its role in the standing order. I think that would be the intention of the committee. Now, yeah. From a okay. finance pers perspective, it doesn't matter to us 
okay. how, how that works. And but it should it should mirror the sorry I've gotten across it. It should mirror the structure that should already been going in within the budgetary process. Hence, the accounting officer is reporting to the uh, senior accounting officer, who is the perm sec of the Department of Finance. So it should mirror. And I have one final question, Chair, if I may, just on because you mentioned it on a, the hobby horse of some of this fiscal council, and obviously the related question of whether there's a one-off fiscal and or economic commission, but um, you mentioned not, you know, the, the current thinking in the department seems to be that it wouldn't be, so the, the way the OBR works is that they basically iterate their fiscal products with the, tre the treasury iterates with them, they send them rounds of what they're for, what with the economic forecast, but also the um, their fiscal, you know, the, the, and the and the OBR produces its EFO and its approves or disapproves of um, the treasury treasury scoring as a result of that. That so, have you thought about that as one model where there's a kind of iterative process between a secretariat of a fiscal council and either yourselves or all, well, it would be finance, and you've decided against it. Just to be clear, it, it isn't my side, and I'm not okay. close enough to it. Um, uh, it they, they may have thought through that. That might be something that that is um, a very live issue. Uh, I, I just don't know how how that's going to be structured, and it will be up to the terms of reference. Okay. Thanks, Lisa. Yes, Colonel Magus, Fatih Road, and to all the Foster, you're just very welcome here this scene as well. Um, in, in terms just of a memorandum of, uh, of understanding, and that in fact I actually think now is uh, an appropriate time uh, for one to be developing that. Uh, and in particular, uh, only we would be disappointed that it will only be confined, we'll say, to budgetary matters and the likes, but it probably could transcend all other matters as well, too, in respect of uh, departments or in respect of committees, and in particular in the way that we then conduct our own affairs and how it is that we deal. Uh, with people who come along here to make representation on behalf, on, on behalf of uh, the civil service and, and, and many occasions and the likes of it. Um, I do think too that it's very, very important that it's clearly defined uh, at the outset. And uh, it's not a good example, but whenever they talk about uh, good fences make good neighbours, it's not a case of building fences, but just the opposite. And, and clarifying exactly what it is that uh, people are responsible for and so on, it encourages that confidence then in all participants. And uh, again, when I talk about all participants here, that um, I know it was raised there, uh, what's the point in having a memorandum of association if, in fact, there isn't any like penalty clause there in the event of someone defaulting? Well, if one entered into a memorandum of association in the very first instance uh, without the best intent, that would be more worrying uh, in every respect. So I'd like to think that in the terms of the development of the memorandum, um, uh, that, um, that people would participate in that there. Uh, in order to ensure sort of the constructive uh, and productive relationships that's required uh, in every way uh, for all departments and that as well too. Um, I do think too like that, um, that that goodwill more than anything else um, is an essential uh, element um, and that uh, it, it, it's the one that should be pursued uh, and every respect, even in the uh, drafting of the document and the likes of it, and that all who participated embraced that entirely. Um, well, in fact, uh, I think that's what my observations of it are. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, as I said, if we can get buy-in into a, a, a memorandum of understanding, then um, I think that would that would be ideal because you're you're bringing people along, and it is that idea of it's a carrot rather than a stick, then because. It, it's a good defined process. People understand what their role is, what the committee's role are, and all, all everybody signed up to what's in there. Yeah. Uh, sorry, just uh, Jeff, <laughs> oh, no, I can sorry. make one final point as well too. Um, a word that you had used earlier on, and it's so pertinent to say at the present time, given our current circumstances, flexibility, and we have to be big enough to embrace and deal with that. Uh, that we never know just what is around the corner, uh, and in and, and particular the way things are constantly and so fluid um, uh, and, 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 and the changes that are taking place, that uh, all should again uh, embrace that, um, i.e. 
flexibility that has to be built in there and that uh, it can be accommodated. Thanks, Mr. Uh, Pat? That's very much, Chair. Thanks very much for coming in. I wasn't going to say anything, I was just going to note it, but as it sort of has progressed, I mean, it just seems so many multi layers on it. I mean, the work seems to be ongoing by the department, and I find that it's a difficult layer of work, as you say. You have to try to get everyone in order to try to buy in, in order to get, and that's what it is, the, the memorandum. As a result of this uh, assembly and the scrutiny of this budget process, I mean, I'm looking at I'm looking at small little things that come out first, and I know that the minister wants to get there with it, and that's multi-year budgets and all of that comes in. And I do feel frustrated at the mountains of layers upon layers that set on top of stuff in order to get something done, which should be really quite simple. It should be buy-in from everyone because it's what it is and what we're about here for. Um, there seems to be a lot here which actually needs to be done in order to bring this memorandum for forward. There still seems to be quite a lot to go. So it's not going to happen in, in the next, this term anyhow. And as you've already stated, it's been ongoing for, for all of those years. But with goodwill, I mean, is there any way, I, I know in two years' time, or sorry, two weeks' time, there'll be a new civil servant, it's not for yourself to answer on this, in order to try and cut out all these layers and just get to the, that is wanted. I mean, I'm sure there's, there's no one can object with where that memorandum of understanding should sit with the budgets. Then we pull in the multi-year budgets. I did budgets this year for the first time in this committee here, and they were coming at me fast and heavy. Do you know, I mean, it just... For me to run a business in order to see it and to do the forward planning, and I wish you every success with it, but it is difficult for us. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it's one of those things that one of the key issues is multi year budgets and the, that degree of what's in our control. Yeah. Um, so a memorandum of understanding has to be flexible enough to allow us to say, well, actually, we haven't got that overall envelope yet, or some other thing has impacted. Um, and it, that, that's the bit where we will have to also rely on the goodwill of the committee if things change. When we come back to you and say, sorry, with the best will in the world, we had, the, we had this idea of how the budget was going to go, but actually it has changed. Uh, sorry, apologies, uh, just, uh, apologies uh, Pat, just on that one. This shouldn't be dependent on just having a multi-year budget. This should be normal no. practice. I mean, companies, mm -hmm. businesses out there day in, day out are having to react to changes and changes happening all the time. This is about this MOU is not about multi-year budgeting. No, no. This MOU is about good practice. As a matter of fact, this MOU is about something that should be instilled in what we do regularly. In fact, we have to have an MOU to do it. I think. Well, it's quite sure, telling. thanks, and that was going to be the point this as well. And I would like to think that we in this committee would be partners with the finance. Uh, department in order to get this up or deliverable if everything was being equal and everything was working out as it should work out. That's where I want to be. I want to be guiding us on to get better, govern better governance for where we are and it, it's a good starting point. But can it be pushed on? We can, we can do as much as we can. Now, there are some areas where um, if we want to, uh, to incorporate things like the review of financial process and how that how the outworking of that with the committee changes, then we may have to wait a while for uh, to understand what that what the new working pattern for for the committee yeah. is for a review of financial process. Um, but there's no there's no reason why we can't press on with this and have it as, as close as possible. Yeah, and update it. Mm -hmm. yeah, the amount of time and slaps now. Good luck with it. Thank is you. that your final comment, Pat? Thanks, sorry, <laughs> thanks. Jim. Um, an MOU is useful if it's actually heated, but surely, given what you've told us about the, the ten years of confusion, it's probably more than ten years because I've been here twenty-two years, and there's been constant problems with this issue. Uh, and surely, the best way to put it to bed is that the announcement of a final budget and the agreement by the assembly has to be set in legislation. That the minister, the department has no choice, and that would concentrate minds. Is that not the way forward? Well, well certainly, the, we have a legislative responsibility to have a budget in place by the 31st of March 
um, our draft budget in place before the assembly by the 31st of March each financial year. Uh, so there is a legislative requirement for us to have a budget. It's the it's it's how we get there. I think is the issue, is what that level of engagement is with committees and how we interact, um, how executive and, and the assembly interacts and trying to improve that process. You're right that that it has had its difficulties. I don't think anybody would deny that um, over the years. One of the, the things that when I talk about not having a standard process, partly because there are so many outside factors that influence that process. The likes of Treasury um, moving uh, spending reviews or not having a spending review or having a single year budget when you when you're looking for a multi year budget, things like that that are completely outside our control have have exacerbated that. But there are some areas where um, we can do the things uh, um, that are within our control, and that's what the MOU is, is is hoping to kind of develop is to make sure that the, the lines of communication are, are open. The people are understanding their responsibilities in terms of what they need to provide to committees um, and how that communication and engagement uh, continues uh, as part of the, the internal budget factors as opposed to the external budget factors that will always um, be outside of our control. Um, are we due another financial provisions bill? I am um, not aware of one, but it's not my side of things, so um, it could well be that someone is working on one. Because that would might be the vehicle to put some of this on a statutory basis, including the MOU. Because at the end of the day, it's, it's all great, but there's no way it can be enforced. Mm. Uh, and surely there has to Good be will. some, some as well as the carrot, there has to be some stick as well. Now, an MOU, if the minister is in a good relationship with the committee, particularly its chair and vice chair, and things are going well, will probably adhere to the MOU. But if there's been a a falling out, which could well happen uh, with any minister, then he can basically shrug his shoulders and say, well, yeah, it's an understanding, but you can't force me. He or she we can't be forced to do anything. There's no sanction in an MOU, isn't that right? And I think if, if people sign up to an MOU, um, then they have a responsibility to, to carry that out. Um, I think there, there's, a, there's certainly a weight of responsibility if the executive have signed up or the first and deputy or first minister sign up on the executive's behalf. Um, you're right that ultimately legisl legislation is a, a more powerful than an MOU and has more long-lasting consequences. Um, whether or not that ministers would be minded to take that step, first of all, maybe an MOU is a good. Let's, let's move this on. Um, you know, if we if we move it on with an MOU, and then in two or three years' time realise that it's not working, maybe that's at the stage when we say we need to, to put some sort of legislation behind this. Well, we've had 22 years <laughs> to see whether these gentlemen's agreements work, and uh, we still. Uh, it's a good job the public don't really understand this, because we would be a laughing stock compared to Wales or the. Or Scotland and how they deal with these things, and this is an absolutely fundamental core oh, role. This is an absolutely core role of this assembly: is the setting of a budget. I mean, this is what it's all about. Now, for very good reasons, we were in suspension for four and a half years. Then we were in suspension for three years. We had crisis after crisis. So I can understand why this hasn't been possible. But hopefully, <laughs> to say this, we're now settling down to a long period of devolved stability, and therefore we have to get this right. Um, am I right in thinking that a member, it wouldn't be the minister, it would be a member could table an amendment to the Financial Provisions Bill to put this on a statutory basis? I, I'm not an expert, but I think that's correct. I think that, member, that's members, individual members can table amendments. Thank you. Okay. Two small ones, Paul, and then Matthew. Yeah, just on the draft uh, memorandum of understanding, there's an appendix there giving a time period. Uh, have you got it in front of you, Jeff? A uh, mm -hmm. table of key stages. Mm -hmm. Yes. Do you see that as being reasonable, with regards to the time? Uh, yeah, I think um, certainly th this is, this was drafted back in 2014. But I mean, I think the principles behind what are what are there seem reasonable to me. Uh, w w when, what would kick off that initial time period? The initial time period of eight weeks there for engagement with committees. 
What at the, the kick off for the formative stage? When would that be yeah. in a year? And this is probably where um, having a a set, a set spending review would help because when you have a set spending review, you can then nearly work out dates before, dates after. Where, when do we want our draft budget to be by? When do we want the revised budget to be by? Um, in theory, in theory, that engagement and that formative stage of engagement could be kicked off at any stage. Um, uh, so you could do that on the first of April, thinking about the budget for the first of April the next year. Um, now, there are there are there are factors there that that will say that's probably not not you shouldn't do it on the first of April because the, the further you get down through the financial year, the more departments will understand what the requirements are for future future years, so on and so forth. So there's a practical element to that, but there's no there's no you cannot start start this process. It's um, Surely, if you're doing it against an outcome, sorry, well, if you're doing it against an outcome related to the PFG, yeah. so with the PFG, there has to be uh, not the way we do the PFG, the way proper do, people do proper PFGs. Actually, there's only three or four outcomes, and it's lined up against either a piece of legislation or a particular budgetary line. If we we're doing that, it's the way we should be doing PFGs. It's you're measuring against the changes. You're not necessarily measuring as every change comes in, because that's the problem. Is if you keep doing that, you're always going to be behind the cycle. Yes, um, but one one of the things I, I guess is um, that, that will influence how committees are engaging on that process is uh, the amount of money that allows the degree of change, um, and and I think that's probably one of the factors in here. So you could start a budget process. Um, with on the first of April and talk through those changes, but maybe we will know in July what future year's budget envelopes will be, and that gives a more a, a reality to, oh yes, if we had a hundred million pounds, we could change A, B, and C. But the reality is, we'll probably only have five, so you can only do part of A and some of B. But surely that would mean then that the committee would be in the mind's eye of the department, which is what the the whole idea was in the first place is that we would be part and parcel of the process of coming to those particular decisions rather than being presented with something and says, oh, look, sort of, um, we're supposed to be getting sort of the sort of um, whatever the sort of the monitoring round was supposed to deliver us. Oh, and then we need to react. But if we were actually part of the process all the way through and we would be aware when the monitoring rounds come through what the changes are likely to be, that's how it should work. Yeah, and I think that's that was what, we were trying to do in that draft was to say there is there is a point at which the committee engage and if we can bring it back earlier that engagement is more effective so the department is aware of what the committee's views are um, at an earlier point um, the the finance committee has a strategic view of all the committee's mm -hmm. positions at an earlier point and that strategic view helps to inform the draft budget as opposed to coming after the draft budget, so the engagement is earlier and more effective. So, so given this timeline, yeah. given that you've given the eight weeks for engagement with committees, given that out of that whole time period, if my arith uh, mental arithmetic is right, that's 36 weeks out of a 52-year cycle, or sorry, 52-week cycle yes. in a year, there'd be nothing to stop this committee, or, in a, or indeed a member of this committee, bringing forward an amendment to the functioning functioning of governments bill if you actually put that in statute that time frame glad you're sitting down Jeff <laughs> um, I, I would caution that I, I, this is still a, at official stage and we are still looking at this as officials um, so there would be um, I would be reticent to say anything on that <laughs> Paul wouldn't <laughs> <laughs> it, it goes back to the point of Jim yep. and this is in statute we had a disgraceful scenario with the last minister whereby he refused to bring a budget to the assembly when we had a draft programme for government and all the committees were squealing about where's the money for this draft uh, programme for government, where, where can we influence this draft uh, programme for government with money and it never came, it was never forthcoming and then the place crashed without a budget in place. Having it in statutory uh, law could well prevent that. And the duty. Uh, what, what other duty has a finance minister got other than bringing forward a budget on a yearly basis? Mm. To me, to me that would be a very good idea for the committee to actually look at with regards to an amendment, a possible amendment to the functioning of government bill. Well, one of the issues with that will be that um, whilst this is um, 
a, an ideal time frame. The reality is that we may have a spending review outcome that collapses that time frame, and therefore we're immediately in breach of legislation. So you could put yourself a defence clause, a uh, reasonable defence clause within uh, the amendment that would allow for mitigating circumstances like that? Mm -hmm. It's, you know, it's something you could consider. I would, uh, my preference would be to um, look th at this MOU as a first instance. Um, and but see there is only one to. fixed date, isn't there? It's the 30th of March, where it's right. Royal Assent yes. for the budget. That is the only single fixed date in this entire. There's, there's a, a fixed date that the, the minister also has to inform the assembly two weeks before um, a budget of the, the overall quantum of uh, funding, but that. That's not fixed, fixed. That's relative to where we've been. Where <laughs> like we've the main estimates budget. are not fixed, fixed. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Folks have turned. Yeah. I think it's sort of related to the same point, but a, a slightly less um, full on uh, remedy, uh, as it were. <laughs> Is there, so um, in New Decade, your approach, it says various things about the ministerial code, uh, updating, putting teeth behind the ministerial code. Um, is, is there an argument, and has it been considered, of inserting the ministerial code into this memorandum of understanding as a possible sanction? And that that is something that we can look at as as officials uh, to see whether that's something. It's obviously a, st a step short of creating novel legislation or inserting an amendment into, for example, the functioning of government bill. But it is it, w it is effectively in statute because the ministerial code here is in statute. It's a it's a thought. Mm. Yeah. Sean, do you want to come in on anything? I don't like him looking over my shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you're not buying, you're not aiming to buy shoes. I can tell you that. <laughs> right. Okay, right. Is he okay? Is the microphone's off? Sure. No, I don't. Sean, do you want to come in? No, that's enough. I can I can let read that and okay. <laughs> okay, thanks very much. Um just before you go, Jeff. And I did sort of slightly allude to the fact, but it's now September. When are we going to see the main estimates that we should have seen in May? Um, I, I understand that, uh, again, it's not my side, but I understand that um, I've been bumped from the committee uh, in the next coming weeks because the estimates are coming to you. So uh, I, I assume that they'll be with you shortly. Maybe when you go back to the department, could you just mention the fact that um, the Chancellor, sorry, I think it was 660 million was made available to Northern Ireland. And indeed, uh, there were settlements made to all the sort of uh, regions that said that would be enable us to look at financial planning and looking at how we could do budgets over the uh, sort of the fourth come to the end of the financial year. And that, I think, was in July. And now we're in September. So, um, and I understand there is a request that we might, the main estimates might go back another week or so. So, just the question: If you're uh, uh, having a quick chat with the current permanent secretary, uh, you might ask her whether she could uh, expedite the process, and we'd be delighted to see them early, rather than having to deal with accelerated passage again, and something that should have been with us uh, at the end of July. Certainly, I, I can I can make those representations. Um, one of the things that I will say in defence uh, of my colleagues is that accelerated passage is a normal process for for the estimates. Uh, we also have um, we're also waiting some assessments from the Department of Health on that six six hundred million pounds to see what their uh, requirements are, uh, and that's very much dependent on potentials for second wave and, and so on and so forth. So. Again, uh, I can assure you that the Minister of Health has got a full shopping list for that 660 oh, million. Absolutely. And the 33 million for the arts, Jeff? Yeah. Um, there are, yes, there are oh. consideration for funding for the arts as well. Um, so th th those are, those are um, being considered. <coughs> to, to sound like a broken record, this has been an unusual year. Um, <laughs> Um, and we, we are Jeff, you've just told us it's been an unusual year for the last decade. Exactly. That's, 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 that's my, um, but we are, we are working um, behind the scenes very hard on these things. Okay. Um, Jeff, thanks very much indeed, as usual. Thank you. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. But uh, please take our good wishes back to everybody in the department. Will do. And answer our questions and get us the main estimates. Okay. And also, remember to mention the functioning of government. <laughs> <laughs> Through the chair. Vice chair. Uh, team.
Uh, just one of the things that might be useful to do if we keep on talking about the role of the sort of the uh, fiscal council and fiscal commission, and Jim's left me quite a, a good note. I think it's quite useful. It might be useful if we commission the research, uh, commission some research into the role of the Scottish Fiscal Commission and how it interacts with the com uh, committees, particularly in the Scottish Parliament. And it might be worth having a quick look because I think the Welsh are trying to do a similar sort, a similar model as well. So let's just see how they, it's done in other areas as well, because that might help inform our sort of discussions, decision-making processes. Matthew, do you want to come in on a bit about uh, the OBR, how we look at the OBR model as well? Because again, I think that's going to be crucial. Uh, well, the OBR is, from memory, was set out in a bit of discrete primary legislation called the Budget Responsibility Act. I think, right, saying that, and that came in in 2010. Um, Excuse me, Mr. Chair. OBR. What's that stand for? Budget, budget responsibility. responsibility. So it's basically the they the scrutinise the Treasury's bud budgets and various fiscal things. But they also the thing that's relevant is that they are mandated in law to produce a full both economic and fiscal forecast twice a year. Uh, so they have to produce, they have both economists and also um, people who are spending experts. So um, they're mandated, in, they're, that, so they're, in that example there are multiple, you know, multiple lessons they have. They, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's a good or bad le example, it's just the, it's one that we learn from and there are lessons in literally every other jurisdictions, the Congressional Budget Office, you know, we, the, you, the Congressional Budget Office has the advantage of being in the states is the advantage of being completely separate from the executive. So, if you know, they basically are utterly independent, and therefore their advice is seen as being non-partisan. So, it has a particular advantage. So, there are loads of things I think we need to consider and discuss. Um, so, but 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 the, the UBR has some interesting examples. I, I, personally, I think the power to um, Produce economic forecasts or have an economic um, analysis of the effects of these policies is important. Uh, policies is important too. Yes. I could have uh, just so that we get it formally. Can I have a, a proposal that we ask Reyes to do this research? Great. Uh, second it, and Jim. Thanks very much indeed, Tim. Thank you very much indeed. If we move on to the next item in the agenda, number uh, item number six, uh, Public Accounts Committee report and excess votes, Northern Ireland, 2016-17. Uh, the following papers, uh, Jim's paper on page 39, uh, correspondence from the PAC on page 40, a uh, letter from the Minister of Finance Department for Infrastructure Access Vote on page 57. Do we have any comments? I don't know if I should declare. Ms. We're, I'm a member of the Public Accounts Committee in addition to this one. So oh, sorry. So oh, sorry. <laughs> Right. If we are in agreement, I'd like to see if we can seek some further detail on the scope and indicative timescales for the Northern Ireland Audit Office examination of the budget process in Northern Ireland, and given this committee's interest and coordination role during the budget process, could we uh, have uh, agreement on that? Great. Sure, you're on access votes at the moment. Yeah. Sorry, right. Uh, so, um, I, I just put a, a quick note then. It's, it's a normal run on the access votes is retrospective approval. For the departments, isn't that right? Mm -hmm. And uh, the above and the approved bu the budget limits. Um, I'm just thinking it might be worth for ourselves putting on record the need to have a clear detail on the time scale involved in passing of the next budget, as it is the first proper one we'll have had and we'll have to cover a lot. That's bringing in the mitigation that we're having against the COVID and the changing landscape on, on Brexit. Uh, yeah. uh, move on to item number seven, review of financial process, written evidence, Department of Finance. Around members at the meeting of the 9th of September, the committee agreed to receive oral evidence from the Department of Finance on the review of financial process. Oral evidence is scheduled for the 7th of October. Uh, the following papers related to the agenda can be found at page 59. Members, do we have any comment? Uh, members, if we're content to note at this stage, and can we uh, note this at stage pending the oral evidence session that we're due in October? Are we content? Thank 
Yep. Is that to now to 22, 23? Second. Uh, due to the COVID implications of this, has this been delayed? Has it been delayed? Yes. Yeah. So, what, what what did you say there, Chair? No, we're content to note at this stage, and we're due to have an oral evidence session on the 7th of October, isn't it? Uh, Currently, well, yes. Currently. Mr Abbott, we hope that there's no further delays, as this is an important, it's a, it's an aid to the work of this committee. Yeah. So, it's something else that we don't have at the moment in order to try and where we're going, so it's just pieces of a jigsaw that can help us all. I think. Great. Yeah. Uh, move on to item number eight. Uh, Ray is coming and giving us an oral briefing on make and buy in Scotland, and we're on the screen. Colin, are you there? Colin. Yep, he's coming now. Ah, let's see. Sorry, I was muted. Oh, sorry, Colin. Sorry, over to you, please. Okay. Um, okay, so I was asked to uh, provide some information about the make and buy approach to uh, sourcing and supplying public, um, sorry, PPE, personal protective equipment in Scotland. Um, so there's a paper in your pack starting at page 67, uh, it's pages 67 to 82. So what I'm planning to do is share that now up here as well, and then I can, um, I can hopefully draw attention to any bits that uh, seem necessary as we go through. Um, so the Committee for Finance has a remit to advise and scrutinise the Department of Finance in relation to public procurement. Now, I know that there's been some ongoing controversy around a PPE order. Uh, fortunately, I'm able to skirt that because I was asked specifically to look at Scotland. Um, and in fact, uh, as I put on the front of this note here, the committee received a letter um, from the Londonderry Chamber of Commerce, uh, actually specifically referring it, uh, that the committee that is, to, um, to this approach in Scotland uh, and whether or not there's there's uh, lessons that can be learned for Northern Ireland. Um, so that's what's led to this briefing note. Um, I'd like the committee please to note at the outset that there isn't actually all that mu much published information available uh, in relation to this, uh, this approach in Scotland because, I guess because it was developed during the crisis, um, there hasn't been much analysis of it yet. Um, so I've had to rely quite heavily on a conversation with the uh, a senior official in National Services Scotland, which is in charge of securing um, PPE at a strategic level. Um, and also then later uh, email exchanges with a, with a senior official. So um, in terms of of how this is viewed in future. Uh, the Scottish Audit Office, or Audit Scotland, I think they're called, will doubtless uh, be looking at um, the PPE procurement in future. So there may be other lessons that can be learned um, when it gets to that stage. Um, I think before we go any further, it's helpful just to highlight the scale of the challenge that has been before uh, the procurers in this um, current sort of COVID era. Um, if we go to page 73, there's a table here that just shows the, the, the sheer quantum of equipment that's needed or has been needed since the 1st of March. It lists, uh, this is the Scottish Government's figures. Uh, from 1st of March to 26th of August, 430 million items of PPE supplied. Uh, now, it's worth noting that over 60% of those items were actually individual gloves. So, in terms of actual size, but it's just it's, it's a huge amount of equipment. Um, and then if we look from page 70, 75 onwards, there are some blue boxes uh, and each of these basically have taken item by item to highlight the additional demand that COVID-19 has placed upon the services. 
Uh, so if you look at page 75 here, you can see with aprons that pre-COVID-19, I mean, it was still quite a lot. 850,000 of these were being used a week in Scotland. Um, now they're more like 5 million a week. So it's a really significant amount of material. Um, and that has placed demand on the supply, uh, which is a bit of a logistical nightmare for anybody. Um, and of course, we have to remember is that it's not just the UK or Ireland or, or even Europe that's looking for this stuff. The whole world has needed more or less the same equipment at the same time and is therefore competing for it. Um, so clearly a challenge. Um, and in short, what the Scots have done is adopt a, a mixed approach um, to meeting that challenge. For example, uh, in relation to aprons, um, there's an example of an existing supplier to the NHS who rehomed manufacture to Scotland. Um, now that had advantages because the supplier was already known to the to the purchasers and to the the system, and therefore there was a, I suppose, a reduced risk of the equipment that was being supplied being substandard because at least there were, there was already a relationship uh, existing there. Um, and uh, another element of that uh, approach was that National Services Scotland redirected some of their resources from the people who are normally producing tender documents and running procurement competitions. They were moved across into the procurement teams to just find PPE and source it. Um, so we can see page 76 in relation to eyewear. Um, this is important because uh, this kind of, kind of eyewear, the, the goggles or face shields were not needed in Scotland before COVID-19. And I assume that's the case across across our health service here as well. Um, now, lots of places were offering to make these um, and you will have seen probably in the press. I mean, at my local high school here in Dundonald, they were making them in the technology department. I know people were making them in the homes. Queens were making them. But the issue is, are they suitable and do they meet the standards? They may work for a non-surgical setting, but not elsewhere. So the movement of people into that part of National Services Scotland that deals with certification of quality and so on, enabled them then to examine things and, and, and quickly get them certified if, if it was necessary to do that as suitable or not suitable for use within different kinds of settings. Um, we move on to masks. Um, and obviously, we, we've all we've all seen the the masks that we have to wear now. Various things in in our own lives, but the these particular um, masks, the what are called the FFP threes, are the ones that are needed in the really high high risk surgical settings. Um, now. There was a manufacturer in Scotland, um, but actually produced things in Taiwan. So what it did was move its manufacturing back to Scotland um, during the during this last uh, few months. And that was supported in this case by what the Scottish government called, uh, no, they didn't call it a loan, they called it a repayable grant. I'm not quite sure what the difference is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> um, uh, so anyway, the, the important point is that finance was supplied via the Scottish government to in, to enable this uh, reshoring to be done. That I think new machines were bought, if I remember rightly. Um, so now this this manufacturer in Scotland can produce five million of these per week, and therefore that's more than Scotland needs. Uh, at the moment, they're using around about 100,000 a week, so it puts them in an export position. Um, so I suppose the question here is that while obviously, I mean, we've been talking about the budget, the forthcoming budget, um, we know that public money is at a premium at the moment. Um, has the Northern Ireland executive been able to do anything similar, offer anything similar to local manufacturers? I don't know. Um, something just... Uh, and, I, and I raised this in the paper, um, that one of the things that the committee has talked about before, and I've talked about with the committee before, is financial transactions, capital money, mm -hmm. that they have found difficult to spend. 
Now, I know some of that had to be surrendered for this financial year, but potentially, is there a use for that? It might be worth um, uh, at least asking the department if they have explored that um, as a potential source of additional funding. Um, just to move on, there's another important point to make in relation to gloves. Um, now, I was told by the official in Scotland that all the gloves had to be imported from, I think it was Italy. Um, now, obviously, it's huge numbers, uh, but the issue is not so much about making gloves. It's about producing the nitrile, um, which places huge demands on the water supply. And we mentioned something like 500,000 litres a day would be required. Now, um, in, in some ways, it seems strange to talk about water in relation to Ireland and Scotland when, when, when we're not short of rain, but it may be that there's a certain standard to the water that it has to be um, cleaned or something. I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not certain of that. But the other issue to do with gloves is just the, the scale of the manufacturer requires a significant investment. I mean, NSS was talking about um, it being in the rain, re region of maybe a hundred million pounds capital investment which may preclude one of the devolved administrations doing it but it doesn't mean that perhaps a uk level or some sort of shared approach couldn't be taken um to, to maybe uh, safeguard future supply um so i think a, a flexible approach is needed i suppose um and we have another example here how external factors can affect um, the ability to supply material that's required and and in this case it was changing specifications during during the pandemic um the who the world health organization actually changed the specification for hand sanitizer which means that now a whiskey distillery or uh, I, I guess any other kind of distillery a distillery can uh, produce alcohol which can be used in hand sanitizer. Pre previously, that kind of alcohol was was not allowed for hand sanitizer. So um, obviously Scotland's in quite a strong position, has a lot of uh, distilleries. So um, but now that external change, obviously they have been able to capitalize on, but it wasn't, it wasn't something that they instigated themselves. So having looked at those different examples, um, it's probably worth just talking a little bit about the um, the structure of the National Services Scotland body um, and how they coordinated these activities. Um, NSS, as it's as it's known, is a central central body that procures strategically for the whole health and social care sector, um, rather like the business services organisation does in Northern Ireland. And there's good sense for having a centralised body. Um, in economic terms, aggregating demand and therefore hopefully getting better value for money. Um, now, the, the official told me that at one stage, uh, during the real height of the pandemic, they were having a daily call that involved, um, in some cases, more than 80 different people. It was chaired by the responsible minister in the Scottish government. Um, and that was coordinating all of the PPE issues they were assessing what what there was there, what the store the store capacity was, when it was going to run out, where did they need to get more from and to. Um, so that that coordination was highlighted as being absolutely key. Quite how you coordinate a call of eighty different people, um, I, I don't know, but but um, presumably using Zoom or something, they they managed okay. Um, it was also interesting to note that there was a level of coordination across the UK. Um, now, the official in Scotland said that the whole of the UK has been indebted to a firm based in Coleraine called Armstrong Medical. Um, I mentioned it by name because it was mentioned by name to me. Um, now, according to National Services Scotland, they produced something like 100 different pieces of kit that were essential disposable items as part of ventilators for ICUs across the UK. Um, so without that, without a, a sort of uh, cross-governmental coordination between different purchasing officers, it would have been much more difficult for them to secure supplies that they needed in the right places. Um, 
I was given another example of that uh, in relation to chlorine tablets, which are uh, essential for the sterilization of equipment within hospital wards. Um, now, there are lots of places that can press a tablet, they can make tablets out of material, but the issue is the supply of the raw material. Now, the guy I was talking to, he couldn't remember whether it was north or south of the border, but there was one place in Ireland which was producing enough chlorine for everybody to be able to to, um, to produce the, the chlorine tablets that are required. Um, so I guess the important lesson to draw from that is that you cannot have a sourcing strategy until you know, firstly, what you need, which is now well established, um, and then... Also, you need to know what you're capable of making in terms of what your, your current manufacturers can do um, and then where, where the raw materials come from. So, um, in conclusion, uh, I guess there have been and will continue to be PPE problems during COVID-19 as long as it remains with us. Um, this note hopefully gives you some indication of the things that have been done in Scotland and gives you at least a starting point of uh, um, maybe thinking f in, in future about recommendations or, or questions you might want to ask of the, the, the relevant department uh, officials. Um, so from there, um, if I can take any questions or attempt to answer any questions, I will. Yeah, Colin, and thanks very much indeed for that. And when your discussions with the uh, Scots, did anybody talk about a national resilience model? No, yeah. it wasn't mentioned in those terms anyway. Yeah, because of course, what we're seeing is that, particularly for manufacturers, the ability of have enough tooled up industry that can be utilised for particular roles is one of the things that's likely to come out of sort of the whole COVID piece. Now, the one thing that we were very lucky in Northern Ireland is we've got some great companies that could be rapidly repurposed to be able mm. to do those things. And indeed, that was one of the issues we had in Scotland. But do you sense in your discussions with the Scots that one of the most important things were having somebody who could coordinate um, the uh, necessary, first of all, uh, the specification of the medical kit so people knew not to manufacture, and then sort of matching uh, capacity with sort of um, specification. Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. And one of the one of the things that um, the official mentioned was that they had worked with partners in a Scottish enterprise, which would be a bit like um, Invest Northern Ireland, I suppose. And and they were able when they were actually in the process of trying to buy stuff from China. They were able to send local agents out to visit the the facilities before they purchased anything and check that the kit was up to scratch. So um, that sort of uh, sort of forward looking coordination that you're referring to there seems to have been uh, a, a feature of, of what they were doing very much so. Thank you, Colin, for a very uh, good uh, research paper, as always. Thank you. Um, you have uh, very beautifully uh, set out uh, all the different demand levels for the different pits of kit that Scotland required. And forgive me if I, if I lapsed out of your presentation there, but I know, I, know you reckon, I know you reckon Northern Ireland will be relative to Scotland, but do we have yet the precise figures for Northern Ireland? Uh, I don't have them because I was asked to look at Scotland. Um, although perhaps I should have thought <laughs> I should have thought to get them. I'm, I'm, I'm sure the figures are available. In fact, I did. I have seen I have seen published figures, now, I, and I'm not sure what time period they cover. Um, but uh, I will I'll forward them to the committee staff. And I'll, I'll get them. And, and another question that you may not be able to answer just yet, but uh, is there any? Uh, corrosion dates uh, or best before dates on any of this equipment that that would a, a nation would have to concern themselves with with regards to bulk buying and storage. Hmm. Uh, no, that's a, that's a, I mean, it's a technical question, but I, I know from personal experience that there is on certain equipment um, because uh, the community group that I was involved in distributing things 
throughout my area. Um, we were given a load of gloves that were out of date from the hospital. Um, so that there, there clearly is a there clearly is a best before date on on gloves, um, and and I'm sure there is on on certain other bits of equipment too. So that probably creates an issue with stockpiling. Yeah, and, and that one it doesn't present a problem whilst the demand is there, but if you mm -hmm. can imagine if if COVID uh, if 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 the medical profession then can relax on COVID mm -hmm. in any given time yeah. period. Uh, you can understand where if you've established networks to procure uh, and even con long-term contracts to procure, then you could end up yeah. with a stockpiling issue, which is probably mm -hmm. what we probably one of the issues we had at the very start of the process, whereby whatever stock we had maybe was out of date uh, yeah. at the start of this emergency. So that's maybe um, something that we consider too. Is it, uh, I, well, it, it, I mean, I think that's probably why they went for a make and buy, and I don't think there's any any suggestion that everything would go to make for 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 all equipment for all of the time, um, but trying to create um, along the lines of a national resilience model, I, I, I guess, um, and, and certainly the Scottish government were criticised for having run down the stocks in advance uh, of the the pandemic, so um, that that that's clearly been. An issue that's been made there, and I would be surprised if it hadn't been at least considered here. But, but again, I, I wouldn't look at Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, Tim? Uh, I've just got okay. a couple of observations that I'd just like your help to support on. I think from and an excellent piece of research, but I think one of the issues to do with this is the critical role that the Scottish Development Agency had and the importance of people like Invest NI. And I think it would be quite useful if we shared this report with, the Depart with both the Department of the Economy and the Economy Committee, if we were content. Um, the second thing is we are all aware that the Northern Ireland Audit Office is doing part of its uh, audit process. It is looking into our response to COVID, and one of the areas it is specifically looking at is PPE. I think this would be a very useful piece of research that we could forward on to the Northern Ireland Audit Office. And I think uh, we get your name in starring lights a bit more. Uh, you'd be able to sort of do that as well. But I think that would be quite quite appropriate to do that. I think one of the things we might do in due consideration is I'd like to draft a letter on behalf of the committee to go to both the Minister for Health and the Minister for the Economy to say that there are lessons here that could be used in both future pandemics. But it's also about resilience and making sure that one of the things we need to look at in Northern Ireland, and indeed across these islands, because it's not just a uh, sort of a Northern Ireland situation, that we have sufficient capacity to be able to deal with these situations. We can't be relying on containers coming from China, or uh, RAF C-17 flights coming from Turkey. We should be able to have the capacity to do that ourselves. And I would like to put on record, particularly for the likes of O'Neill's and other companies as well the speed with which they were able to repurpose themselves. My other concern is that having repurposed themselves, these companies now are beginning to wonder about what do they do next and do we make a message and I'll come in Melissa, uh, can we make a message therefore that we might ask the Minister for the Economy and the Minister of Health to think about potential long term orders? I'm sorry, Melissa. Uh, yes, Chair, just as uh, information, uh, I actually uh, visited O'Neill's along with uh, the Minister uh, when he carried his visit uh, to the van. Uh, and Kieran Kennedy, the CEO of O'Neill's, actually, we seem to have access to figures probably the rest of us didn't have at that stage. Uh, and there's no doubt that it's beyond the capacity of industry, both in Britain and in the island of Ireland. Uh, to meet the demand that there will be for PPEs. Uh, without doubt, we are still going to continue to rely on um, uh, the Chinese connection, uh, and whilst at the same time uh, exploiting every opportunity of these islands to be uh, as, sufficient, uh, as sufficient as possible. But no, no way are we going to be able to be self-sufficient, and that seems to be the evidence uh, uh, in relation to the demand that there will be for PPEs in the future. Thank you. And again, with your permission from the committee, I'd like to write to the London Dairy Chamber of Commerce 
and given the, sort of the details of what, what we're proposing to do with our pace, we're content. Great. Thank you. Uh, if we move on to, uh, thanks very much indeed, Colin. Thank you. Sort of look forward to seeing you soon. Okay. Cheers. Cool. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Uh, if we move on to item number nine, uh, the Civil Service Injury Benefit Scheme Amendment Scheme Northern Ireland 2020. I'd like to inform the members uh, that the uh, clerk's brief of the paper is on page 84. Anybody's phone too close to the microphone? No, it's not mine, thank goodness. No, it's been going all day. Yeah. And the uh, civil clerk's brief is page 84. Uh, the, Northern, the Civil Service Injury Benefit Scheme Amendment Scheme, Northern Ireland 2020 SL5 is at page 85. I want to remind members that the amendment scheme came to the committee as an SL1 on the 9th of September 2020, when the committee was informed that it is not subject to assembly control. However, Article 4 dash 8 of the superannuation Northern Ireland Order 1972 provides that before a scheme comes into operation, the Department shall lay a copy of the scheme before the Assembly. I would like to inform the members that the Committee had no objections at the SL1 stage and the Department has more, more changes, has made no changes to the amendment scheme. I am seeking your approval to note. Do we so note? Noted. Uh, there is no chairperson's business. If I move on to item number 11 of the agenda, which is correspondence. Uh, from the Commissioner for Public Appointments regarding the Functioning of Government Bill, page 95. I remind members that at its meeting of the 8th of July, a briefing note was presented by RAISE on the regulation of public appointments in the context of consideration of the bill. Remind members that it was agreed to include in the Functioning of Government uh, Bill report a recommendation to the First and Deputy First Minister to make legislative provisions to bring the Office of the Commissioner for Public Standards to appointments to international standards. I would like to inform the member the Commissioner for Public Appointments has now written give, asking to give evidence to a paper which will be submitted to the committee at the end of September. Our members are content to receive that. Yes. I would like uh, agreement to ask the Commissioner for Public Appointments to provide the committee with a copy of her paper for the committee's consideration so the committee may decide if it considers oral evidence necessary at this stage. I think a, a paper may be sufficient, but uh, I think I would be content for that. Aren't we content? Content. Uh, a correspondence from the Department regarding the cost of the RHI inquiry. It's page 96. Members for comment. Paul? Uh, I've got my cold here, Chair. I'm trying to find it here. Apologies. Is it, no, you're okay. Uh, so normally, I know you normally be on that like a rocket. So. Yeah, this is the actual cost of the inquiry itself. Yeah. Uh, Again, I looked at this uh, two nights ago, Chair, and yeah, I, I suppose that's the cost of trying to get to the truth of and the kernel of these matters. Uh, but again, it's it's the cost of the inquiry is one thing. The cost of doing nothing out of that inquiry is a completely yeah. different bill. Uh, so I think that whilst this cost has come and gone, I think we have to see uh, the true value of it and how we actually proceed and how the executive is proceeding. Uh, in the days ahead, uh, and to the recommendations of the inquiry. Yeah. Just on the note on the inquiry, you will be aware that the minister uh, has uh, been detailed off by the uh, first and deputy first ministers to chair a subcommittee of the executive into uh, taking forward the lessons identified. I was going to say learned, but I don't think they've got round to that stage yet. From the RHI inquiry. I think, and I've asked the clerk to, I've asked Jim to get in contact with the department, because one of the things, obviously, if the minister is taking the lead for this, I think we'd probably want to see the terms of reference to see whether this comes to our committee for, uh, obviously, for scrutiny of, as, as the work goes forward, particularly if it's being led by, by the minister. Uh, I and I'll let uh, Jim do a bit more liaison, so maybe if we can report back at uh, next week's meeting, if, that, if you're content with that. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the next item of correspondence is the from EPIC regarding the proposed changes to the building regulations in Northern Ireland, page 99, and uh, consider seek agreement to consider the matter again following the consultations. Are we content? Uh, the next item on the agenda was from medical students regarding university places in 102. These were students who had received uh, information or had been received regarding extra medical school places at. Queen's University 
University of Belfast. Uh, on behalf of the on behalf of uh, this uh, committee, I think we should pass on our thanks to both the Minister for Finance and also the Minister for Health for acting remarkably quickly to deal with this situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, we talk many times about not being able to get ahead and deal with the bottlenecks and things that happen. But I think the cooperation between the Department of Health and the Department of Finance in this has been exemplary. Yes. And I'm glad I'm glad to see that has gone through. Would we be content to pass that message on? Yes, to... I'm sure. Sorry. Go ahead. Pa and uh, yes, uh, we are content and well done. And that we have to say, uh, the minister uh, for with uh, the economy and with health and that, that announcement yesterday with the additional places. Uh, it's just uh, one already at the importance this is, and, and for them to move quickly on it. And you may I, I want to mention as well about the medical school at McGee and the opportunity for more places for their own future. So it's all joined up and it's all good and it's all positive. And I do agree with you in order to send the letter to the Minister of the Economy and of Health. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Jim? I just want to just check something. Does it solve the entire problem? Um, it's very welcome, obviously, but does that mean that everyone who's got the relevant grades is going to get a place? I think they're either going to get a place or they're going to get a deferred place for ne a guaranteed deferred place for next year. Okay. There is an, I, I understand, and I stand to be corrected. I understand, Jim. There has been an uplift in places, but also for the excess of everybody who had previously received an offer, and if they can't receive those, those excesses will be guaranteed a deferred place next year. Because obviously, apart from the COVID issue. We do need these doctors, and we needed them before the COVID had appeared. We're chronically short, so I'm glad it's happening. Very welcome. Yeah, and uh, look, uh, I'll declare interest here. Um, from from my perspective, I would like to see some further work in removing the cap overall in sort of university places in Northern Ireland. This is not just an issue for sort of uh, medical students, but it seems quite ridiculous that. One of the things that is impeding us um, getting people into higher education in Northern Ireland is the cap on places. I think uh, I just want to go on record as, as sort of that, but I declare an interest in that particular point. Thank you. And where are we? Uh, shall we now move on to the forward work programme? That takes us out of public session, doesn't it, Jim? If we uh, no, chair doesn't. No. Have I missed something? Hey. Okay. Oh, sorry. Yes. Uh, yes, there's num number uh, six and seven correspondence. Oh, number six and seven. Uh, from the Committee of Health to the Department of Finance regarding QUB medical places, page 104. I think we've covered that, have we? Yes. Yep. Well, that was covered under five chairs, but it's. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, uh, Seek agreement to note. Yes. Uh, from the Committee for Health to the Department of Finance regarding financial support for carers. Sorry, my apologies. Page 105 and tabled at page 55 is the response for the Department to the Committee for Health. Can I seek your agreement to note that? Absolutely. Yeah. I can also seek your uh, agreement to note the remaining items of correspondence, including in the table of correspondence. Are we content? Thank you. Uh, can I seek your agreement to note the information request to the Department and routine papers circulated on the 10th of September 2020? Are we content? Thank you. Uh, move on to the forward work programme. Do we gonna, want to go no, on? No, public, public session. Oh, it's a public session. Uh, if we move on to the uh, uh, the forward work programme for December 2020, is at page 110. Uh, Chair, there are a couple of things that have just come to light there. As um, Jeff McGuinness has said, uh, the bringing of the main estimates is now looking a uh, like the main estimates or eleven session may be on the seventh of October. Yeah. A uh, now the the department would normally or the committee would normally see uh, the main estimates of the week the, of the meeting before that, which would mean that they would come on the thirtieth of September. So we're seeking confirmation with the department that that that's going to happen. A uh, that would then mean that pensions division uh, uh, would be scheduled for the fourteenth. A uh, with the 21st would be the October monitoring round and the review of the financial process. Uh, they're the same officials. Um, or possibly the review of the financial process on the 14th and pensions on the 4th of November. So we look at how, how that works out. I, I, what I've been trying to do is to ensure that we don't uh, have 
too many oral evidence sessions at the minute until we're sure about where the committee is going with the functioning of the government no, no, bill and no. how much time that will take in the context of short meetings. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, just on that, uh, a bright eye. Bishop Teal, the MLA, might bring an amendment to the function of government bill, which will solve that issue year on year from now on. <laughs> you never know. Right eyed Bushy Teal chair might be supporting them on it. You <laughs> never know. Um, just, uh, just again, we're talking about the forward work programme. Um, and I know Matthew will probably want to come in on this one. I am very conscious of the fact that the 1st of January next year is rapidly approaching. And there are some very significant issues that I think we need to start considering, particularly on implications on finances in Northern Ireland, issues to do with everything from state aid rules, role of the European Court of Justice, how there are likely to be implications to do that as well. Basically, I think there's a lot of things that our committee needs to consider, but I don't know enough about what we need to be considering. And one of the things I would like to make a proposal through is that if we asked uh, Rays to do some research on some of the likely areas that are going to impact on the um, Finance Committee, and particularly on our sort of overview as we look over the horizon into next year to start getting an understanding of likely of the scope of it. Matthew, do you want to come in on that? Yes, yeah, sorry, thank you, Chair. Um, there's two connected things. One, uh, I obviously agree 1,000%. Um, is there merit in us writing to the department to ask specifically, you know, a quicker way of get of doing this than we, we, we in addition to what Rays are doing, should we be writing to the department and saying, give us early sight? To, so I don't know if we're going to, what is going to come in front of us in terms of secondary legislation in the next few months. I don't know if Jim has had uh, clarity on that. I've been pressing for it. We have had an ex like a frankly, an abysmal level of information from uh, the executive writ large about, leave aside the merits of, of what's happening, but the actual legislative burden on us in the next few months, whatever your, your view on any of this, um, we need to know exactly what we have to do, what we have to consider. So there's that. What is the department working on? The, there's, well, and there's also the administrative stuff around exit protocol specifically, but just exit generally, because there will be a range of things out with the protocol that will affect. So once we have that from what, what the department's prioritising, we'll know what we should, I guess, be prioritising in terms of scrutiny. And as a point separate to Brexit, actually, if I may, just on the on the, um, on the the forward work programme, which is about the appointment of the new head of the civil service and whether we should be seeking uh, an early evidence session from that person um, uh, about a range of things. I think just a, a wider question on this, because we've already, and I think it was earlier on during this committee meeting, I said because uh, our minister has been given the role by the executive to look at the uh, lessons coming out from RHI. And obviously, what's going to be key to that is the new, whoever's going to be the new head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service and how they fit in with that process. Now, what I'm not sure is whether we feel as if we should be seeking an early Bearing in mind, we've asked for the terms of reference of what our, our finance minister is likely to be looking at about the sort of reform of the reforms that are likely to come out of RHI. If that is the case, should we be looking at a an early discussion with the new head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service to discuss some of those issues? Bearing in mind that that sits within our that does sit within our remit, as I understand it. Can I have your thoughts? Yeah, I'd support support that. Sure. Uh, uh, to help with that, that process, I know we have no input into who that person is. I don't even know who the applicants are. I'm going to presume. Oh, well, we know it's all the candidate. Thanks uh, to, yes. the, to the minister okay. yesterday. So, <laughs> so most of this comes in front of us, and uh, I don't want to be put out. I don't just say I don't know, but it, it's a case of this is very important to where we're trying to go and the amount of savings that we're going to make here, you know, so it can be more of the same or we're going to try to get someone that is going to really try to look at changing the whole makeup of this. Um, th that appointment is down to the First and Deputy First Minister, is that correct? Uh, my understanding is that there has been a short list and it's up to the First and Deputy First Minister who make the final selection. I, that is my understanding. But I think, bearing in mind the evidence we've received today on uh, around the MOU, 
the importance of the sort of the budgetary process, the centrality of the leadership from whoever is in charge of the civil service to make that happen. I think it's. I, look, uh, I'm not trying to add extra work to us, but I think that would probably be something that we should be taking an oversight of. Sir Matthew, you just wanted to come in there again. Reform. Reform. That's about just to finish. It's on reform, and it's important that we that we know that we've asked for this reform, and ever who's appointed is up for the reform. Yeah, Melissa. Uh, just through the chair, um, uh, I'm glad that it's not uh, the decision of the deputy and first minister to make the appointment at the end of the day, because I'm sure that would end up coming back and. Uh, and their faces as well too, but it is. No, it is actually. It, it is, is up to it them. Is, it is there. But I, I, I think they maybe rubber stamp it at the end of the day. Oh. <laughs> well, was that actually, decision the, the, point the, that to, the, the point that I want to go on to to, to make just is that uh, yes, we should be meeting with uh, yep. the person appointed, and I know that that request probably is actually going on from the PAC committee as well. Good. Okay. And uh, that, uh, 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 like as you said about the memorandum of understanding, that's uh, really like the first steps, uh, and it in a sense that we both begin to understand each other in, in, in that way. But just to move on to another point that you raised there earlier on, too, just about the implications uh, of uh, support to industry and the likes of it, and much of that is all going to be up in the air now as well, too. And uh, depend to what extent the British are quite prepared to uh, break the law. Uh, and that uh, that will have very very serious implications there. So, in bringing a report to this committee, it probably has to present to us two scenarios: i.e., uh, if they do break the law and continue going down the road that they are going down, uh, to what extent are they given support? Or if here in the case of uh, the north of Ireland, they're still going to be subjected to uh, the rules of the European Union in terms of subsidy to industry in all respects. Is the one thing I can say in your response to your uh, remarks, Molly, is that the length of time we get anybody to get a report here, <laughs> it'll be the middle of next year, yeah. and there'll only be need one, any. Right. Right. Yes. Sorry. Sorry, Chair. If, if members would be content to, to receive the research and the response from the department on that, yes. there's also a, an oral level session from Public uh, Sector Reform. Division, which would be in relation to civil service reform, mm. and then at that stage decide what exactly it is when the is committee that scheduled for. Uh, Jim, uh, next week, isn't it? It's next week, yeah. Yeah. So we... at that stage, waiting until the person has been appointed, and then having a clear yeah. view of what the committee wants to bring the head of the civil service in on. Yeah, that I think that fair? would I think that would be useful. Are we content? Come on. Yeah. Can hardly see you behind. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Okay. Uh, in that case. Uh, the dreaded thing in any other committee that always is the case. Any other business? Yes, Chair. Yeah. Uh, can I just raise, Jim, you usually have, uh, Park usually has a, a, a page here of all the outstanding correspondence from the department. Uh, I don't seem to see it in this pack. Are we saying that there's a clean bill of health from the department and we're not waiting for anything outstanding? Or maybe I've just missed it. No, Chair, I will, I will get back to it here. But as far as I'm aware, I. So it should be just before. Uh, yeah, that seems to be an admitted. Unfortunately, apologies about that. But uh, as far as I'm aware, there was something in it that we thought was overdue, but wasn't, and everything else is currently on schedule. Okay, good to know. Thank you. Okay. That means we shouldn't feel guilty about sending loads of requests in this week. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much indeed. Next, uh, just one thing: the parks or the uh, chairs liaison group met yesterday. Now I had to leave before the meeting was complete. I understand there is some discussion about going back to normal times and sessions for uh, committees and moving of rooms. So, subject to um, CLG and the speaker. Our next meeting will be at 12.30 in here in the Senate chamber, 12.30 to around about 2 o'clock. But I think the, the intent is probably to move us back to uh, our normal times. Uh, I think sometime in October that's possible. Yeah, yeah. But I think, there, I think there's some discussion about bringing it forward. So just please keep a careful eye on your timing and journey. And it's uh, good to be back. And uh, thanks, thanks very much indeed for the meeting. Thanks, okay, everybody. Thank Cheers. Thank you. Here, Sean. Bye. See you at home.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland.